So, good day everyone. Today, me and my group are going to report the lesson five in understanding the self, which talks about the psychology, um, the self viewed in various theories. So, let me first introduce the members or the reporters for this class side. So, the first reporter is Miss Joria M. Oles. We're going to report the Albert Bandora. Miss Limero Campano will be reporting the Eric Erickson. Miss Samantha Luis S. Gutierrez will be the reporter for George Kelly. And Miss Chiara Droello will be the reporter for William G. And Mr. Ed Martolentino will be the reporter for Sigmund Fodd. And Miss Angeline J. Parano will be the reporter for Carl Jung. And lastly, Ms. Lynette Rojas will be the reporter for Harry's Talk Sullivan. So I will give the time for the first reporter to talk or discuss his or her report in line with this topic. Good day, everyone. My name is Cara Derello, the first reporter of the Group 5. I will discuss the under the self as a cognitive construction, me self and I self by William James. William James. James theorized the components of the self, which he divided into two categories, me and I. The me is the separate individual a person refers to when talking about their personal experience. On the other hand, the I is the part of the self that knows who they are and what they have accomplished in life. There are five categories in me, self, and I, self. First is the material self. It refers to mind. The material self consists of what belongs to a person. These are some examples. My clothes, my house, my friends, my car, and my family. Second is the social self. It refers to ours. This is the marks who are in the specific social situation we tend to change our actions, thoughts, emotions, words, and mannerism based on the current social situation or the people with whom we are interacting. Third is spiritual self. A spiritual self is who we are at our core, including our personality, values, and conscience. Our spiritual self typically remains relatively stable throughout our lifetime. Fourth is the relational self, refers to other people with whom we have a personal relationships. As you can see in the pre presentation, the examples is, I am Noah's father. Lastly is the collective self. Collective self is about being and existing as a part of a group with shared attributes. For example, I am a Filipino. So guys, this is the last slides of my report. Does anyone have a questions or queries in my report? If not, let us proceed to the next topic in line with this lesson. Once again, my name is Kara Idorello, the first reporter. I am Jeria M. Oles, and I will discuss the Bandura's Social Cognitive Theory. Who is Bandura? Albert Bandura, he was a Canadian-American psychologist born in Alberta, Canada, 1925, a professor in psychology at Stanford University. Bandura also discovered that learning occurs both through those beliefs and through social modeling, there be originating social cognitive theory 1986, interested in behaviorist theories. Bandura's social cognitive theory contains three factors, the cognitive factors, also called personal factors, consist of knowledge, expectations, attitudes. The behavioral factors, it contains skills, the practice, self-efficacy, and environmental factors, social norms, access in community, 
influence on others' ability to change own environment. These three factors are it determines human behavior. Next is Albert Bandura's Bobo Dal Experiment, 1961. Kids saw adults punching an inflated doll while narrating their aggressive behaviors such as kick him. These kids were then put in a toy-deprived situation and acted same behaviors they had seen. That children are able to learn through the observation of adult behavior. What you should know According to social cognitive theory, knowledge accusation is related to observing others with social interactions, experiences, and outside influences. People learn behaviors by replicating the actions of others. Like, people can learn through observation. Mental states are important to learning. Learning does not necessarily lead to behavior change. Class is the significance of Vandora's theory. Vandora's theory provides us with four ideologies to show how to create the ideal conditions for positive learning to take place. The attention, retention, reproduction, and motivation. These all four conditions are enabled students can act as both educators and learners. This is where my report ends. Do you have a questions? If none, let us proceed to the next topic in line with this lesson. At it is the time the next reporter will present their report. Thank you. Hello and good day everyone. I am Samantha Luis S. Gutierrez and I will discuss the George Kelly Psychology of Personal Concepts. George Kelly is one of the psychotherapists and academic psychologists. And he was born in Perth, Kansas, USA on April 28, 1905. His early education was in one-room schoolhouse and was tutored by his parents and Kelly finishes college with a degree in physics and mathematics. And he died on March 6, 1967. View of Human Nature all human beings can develop their own theory which allow them to anticipate and future events accurately. It is like making decisions and choosing alternative actions. There are 11 corollaries and these are the following. Construction corollary, a person anticipates events by construing their replications. For example, if Kylie's mother has given her a birthday party surprise last year, then she will predict that she will receive another birthday party surprise on the next birthday. Individuality corollary, a person differ from each other in the construction of events. Organization corollary, each person characteristically evolves for his convenience in anticipating events. A construction system embracing ordinal relationships between constructs. Dichotomy corollary, a person's construction system is composed of a finite number of dichotomous constructs. Choice corollary, a person chooses for himself that alternative in a dichotomized construct through which he anticipates the greater possibility for extension and definition of this system. This is an elaborate choice choosing pole of construct. Range corollary, a construct is convenient for the anticipation of a finite range of events only. Experience corollary, a person's construction system varies as he successively construes the replication of the events. Modulation corollary, the variation in a person's construction system is limited by the permeability of the constructs within whose range of convenience the variance lie. So this is the last slide of my report. Fragmentation corollary, a person may successively employ a variety of construction subsystems which are inferentially incompatible with each other. Commonality corollary, to the extent that one person employs a construction of experience which is similar to the employed by another. The psychological processes 
are similar are similar to those of the other person. Sociality corollary to the extent that one person constructs the construction processes of another, he may play a role in a social process involving the other person. This is all for my report. Does anyone have any question or clarification? If not, we can proceed to the next topic and reporter. Again, I am Samantha Luis Escutierrez, the reporter of George Kelly's. Hello everyone. Um, first of all, I'm gonna apologize for the background noises or the noises from the surroundings because it's a little bit raining right now, so you may hear noises from the rooftop. So I apologize for that. But uh, but without further ado, I am Edmar J. Valentino, and I'm gonna tackle or I'm gonna discuss the Freud theory, which is the development of the self, which includes the development of personality, Freud's five psychosexual stages. Then Freud's level of consciousness or the two levels of mind and Freud's structure of personality. So first, who is Sigmund Freud? So Sigmund Freud, his full name is Sigismund Shlomo Freud. He was born on May 6, 1856 and died on September 23, 1939. He was an Austrian neurologist and the founder of psychoanalysis. So the five psychosexual stages of development according to Freud. So Freud proposed that personality development in childhood takes place during five psychosexual stages. During each stage, sexual energy or the libido is expressed in different ways through different parts of the body. Freud believed that life was built around tension and pleasure. And he also believed that all tension was due to the buildup of libido or the sexual, sexual energy and that all pleasure came from its discharge. So the first psychosexual stage is the oral stage. So age, age ranging from zero to one year old. So oral stage, infant achieves gratification through oral activities such as feeding, thumb sucking, and bubbling. In this stage, libido is centered in the baby's mouth. Babies get much satisfaction by putting all sorts, all sorts of things in its mouth to satisfy the libido. The it is the mouth-oriented stage, such as sucking, biting, and breastfeeding. Um, it is where a child put everything in its mouth. Um, I don't know if, um, if it's also to you, but when I was a child, I remember that I eat the unnecessary things, a dirty, dirty thing that is not meant to be eaten, but I put it on my mouth. <laughs> That's it. That is the oral stage, which we put everything in our mouth. Next stage is the, the anal stage. So the anal stage is from 1 to 3 years old, age ranging from 1 to 3 years old. So the child learns to respond to some of the demands of society, such as bowel and bladder movement. In this stage, libido becomes focused on the anus and the child derives great pleasure from defecating. In this adult in this stage adults can impose 
Restriction to child on when or where the child can defecate. This helps child to learn how to control their bowel movement and become an anal and retentive personality who hates mess, is obs obsessively tidy, punctual, and respectful of a child authority. Um, in, it is where the stage, as I remember when I was a child, um, I don't want to, to go to the CR in the right moment, in that kind, in the particular moment, because I was playing or something like that. That's why sometimes the worst happens, which is pagtata is a chance. Um, sorry if you're eating there. But, yeah. Hindi ko alam if nangyari din sa inyo, but nangyari sa akin. And after all, I'm only a child that time. Next stage is the phallic stage. The phallic stage is from age ranging from 3 to 6 years old. So phallic stage, the child learns to realize the different sex between male and female. So the libido or the desire centers upon their genitalia as the erogenous zone. Child becomes aware of the anatomical sex differences like child knows that boys have the male reproductive system or particularly the, the penis and girl has the female reproductive system, particularly the vagina. So, yeah. In this stage, we know that we know the difference between male and female. We know kung ano yung, we know kung ano yung meron sa lalaki at kung ano yung meron sa babae. Next stage is the fourth stage of psychosexual is the latency, the latency stage. So, so in this stage, a child continues his or her development, but sexual urges are relatively quiet. So latency is from age ranging from 6 to puberty. Latent means hidden. So hidden stage is that. Libido is dormant or inactive and no further, further psychosexual development takes place. Freud thought that most sexual impulses are repressed during the latent stage and sexual energy can be sublimated towards schoolwork hobbies, and friendship. Much of the child energy is channeled into developing new skills and acquiring new knowledge, and play becomes largely confined to either largely confined to either children of the same gender. I think it is a stage where we we um we all we we just think of um acquiring acquiring um, new knowledge, uh, new knowledge, um, learning new things based on our curiosity, and we. It is also the stage where we, um, we want to build strong relationships with our friends, um, friendship, just just to have strong relation, to have a strong friendship. Um, in this stage, we could have a besties and best friends, or maybe call that. Um, that is the latency stage, but there is no sexual intercourse, intercourse in this stage. So last but not the least is the genital stage. Genital stage is from age ranging from the puberty to adult. So the growing adolescent shape the, gro the growing adolescent shakes off the old de dependencies and learn learns to deal maturely with opposite sex. My in in um my sexual intercourse is stage. It is the it is a time of adolescent sexual experimentation, the successful resolution of which is settling down in a loving one to one relationship with another person in our 20s. 
here there is a sexual intercourse in this stage so we think maturely in this stage um we think of marriage we think of um of love of pure love or true love um we think of um um, people that we want to go uh, to live with um yun yung stage na yun yun yung nandito sa stage na to. yeah and particularly nandito yung sexual intercourse this is the yung part so may meron dyan dito na stage because um we are Thinking of love in this stage and mature um, decisions and thinking. So that is the five psychosexual stages uh, according to Freud. So the the five psychosexual stages is the the oral stage, the adult stage, the phallic stage, the latency latency stage, and the genital stage. Next is the Freud level, Freud's level of consciousness or the Freud three levels of mind. Freud likened the three levels of mind to an, ice, to a, to an iceberg. So as you can see in the picture, that is a big iceberg. So the top of the iceberg that you can see above the water represents the conscious mind. The conscious mind. I think that is the white colored there in the picture. So the conscious mind contains all of the thoughts, memories, feelings, and wishes of which we are at any given moment. This is the aspect of our mental processing that we can think and talk about rationally. This also includes our memory, which is not always part of consciousness that can easily but can retrieve easily and brought into awareness the iceberg that is submerged below the water that is still visible visible is the pre-conscious i think that is the light blue light blue color there in the picture pre-conscious that is the pre-conscious so the free consciousness is of anything that could potentially be brought into the conscious mind it refers to the thoughts you aren't actively thinking but can call to mind easily given the tr right trigger next is the last is the bulk of the iceberg that lies unseen beneath the water line represents the unconscious mind that is the dark blue there in the picture so the unconscious mind is the reservoir of feelings, thoughts, urges, and the memories that are outside of our conscious awareness. The unconscious contains contents that are unacceptable or unpleasant, unpleasant such as the feelings of pain, anxiety, or conflict. So that is the three Freud's three levels of mind, which is the um the conscious mind the pre-conscious mind and the unconscious mind next last slide from my reporting is the freud's structure of personality so freud's personality theories um freud Personality theory. Freud personality theory saw psyche structured into three parts. The personality structure, according to Sigmund Freud, is the id, the ego, and the superego, all developing at different stages in our lives and uh, and on our own levels of mind. So according to Freud's psychoanalytic theory, the id is the primitive and the instinctual part of the mind 
that contains sexual and aggressive drives and hidden memories. The id remains infantile and in its function throughout a person's life and does not change with time or experience, as it is not in touch with the act with the external world. It is not affected by real reality, logic, or the every or the every everyday world, or the everyday world, as it operates within the unconscious part of the mind. So, this level, this a personality doesn't change because it is hidden and it's not affected by external reality. So it operates on the pleasure principle, which is the idea that every wishful impulse should be satisfied immediately regardless of the consequences. When it achieves its demands, we, are ex we experience pleasure, but if we fail to achieve the demand, we feel unpleasure. Next is the ego. The ego is, is it developed to mediate between the unrealistic id and the external real world. It is the decision-making component of personality. It works by reason not like the id, which is unreasonable. So e ego is reasonable, id is unreasonable. It operates accordingly to the reality principle, working out realistic ways of satisfying the needs demand, often from compromising or postponing, postponing satisfaction to avoid negative consequences of society. If ego fails in its attempt to use the reality principle and anxiety is experienced, unconscious defense mechanisms are employed to help ward of unpleasant feelings, anxiety, or make good things good things feel better for the individual. Next, individual toward individual. Super ego. The super ego, it operates as the moral conscience, which incorporates the values and morals of society which are learned from one's parents and one's parents, parents and others. According to Freud, it develops around age from age of three to five years old during the phallic stage of psychosexual development. This function is to control the ease impulses, especially those which society forbids, such as sex and aggression. It also persuades the eye to turn to moralistic goals rather than simply realistic ones and to strive for perfection. It consists of two systems, the, con the consigns, consigns and the ideal self. The consigns is the consigns can punish the ego through causing feel feeling of guilt. For example, if the ego gives in to the id demands of the superego may make the person feel bad through guilt. So the consigns, um when we when we make our when we do the id personality, which we become unreasonable to things and we, we tend to do um unreasonable bad things to our to to other individuals and to our lives, um the consigns from the superego in the system of the superego, the consign um, um, help us to feel guilty of what we done, of what we did, for us to know that it is wrong for us to do that bad thing. Next is the ideal self. is an is an imaginary picture of how your all us how you ought to be. And, and uh, the ideal self is an imaginary picture of how you ought to be and represent career aspiration, how to treat other people, and how to behave as member of society. So, 
So that is the first um the structure of personality according to Freud, which is the id, the ego, and the super ego. If you say id, it is a pleasure principle. If you say ego, it is um it's ego. If you say ego, it is the reality principle and if this is super ego it is the moral principle so that ends my discussion i hope you understand it i hope you understand it well um um before i end this before i end my discussion is there any other is there any question or queries about the the Freud theory. If none, if there is none, so I'm gonna pass this virtual stage to the next reporter. So thank you so much for listening and keep safe and God bless you all. See you soon. Bye. You are what you do, not what you say you'll do. Good day everyone, I am Angeline Haba Pareño from 1BS BioB. Today, I will discuss to you Carl Jung's theory of personality, which is considered to be a benchmark in personality psychology. So who is Carl Jung? Carl Jung was a Swiss psychoanalyst who was initially influenced by the work of Sigmund Freud, but later chose a different route to come up with his own analysis. Jung's theory was actually invented to demonstrate the complexity of human personality and its consequences. Here we are going to discuss the ideas of Carl Jung, we are going to examine the individuation process. So what is individuation process? So individuation process, a process Jung believed to be essential for a healthy functioning personality. Jung viewed as particularly important namely the persona, the shadow, the anima and animus, and the self. So first, let's define the psyche, one's total personality. The psyche, or one's total personality, is composed of a conscious and unconscious realm. The conscious realm, composed of ego, and the unconscious realm, he split it into the personal unconscious and collective unconscious. So... Personal unconscious is composed of personal history, while the collective unconscious is composed of instincts and archetypes. So what is an archetype? Archetypes are the universal inborn models of people, behavior, or personalities that play a role in influencing human behavior. How can one confront the unconscious? Jung believed that dreams provide access to the unconscious realm. So here, we can see here the four major Jungian archetypes. So first, let's discuss the persona. So first, let's define persona. The word persona was used in Roman times to signify a mask worn by an actor. In an analogous manner, in Jungian psychology, the persona represents the one's public personality or mask, one's social roles. So persona is a mask that each of us wear in our interaction with others in society. 
example, as to what a man should appear to be, he takes an aim, earns a title, represents an office, he is this or that. So the next Jung's personality archetype is the shadow. Shadow. One's dark side, part of ourselves that we dislike. The course of one's certain personality traits elicit negative feedback and even punishment from others. The shadow influences emotions, thoughts, and behaviors in a manner which is beyond conscious control. According to Jung, shadow is not only composed of negative traits, rather in the process of over identifying with the persona often people reject personality traits not because they are harmful but because they don't fit with the dominant social attitudes in addition to the shadow is another archetype which normally suffers from underdevelopment is a contrasexual archetype term the anima in males and the animus in females. While the persona is oriented outward, acting as a barrier, protecting the ego from external social world in an analogous manner, the animus and the anima is oriented inward, protecting the ego from the sometimes threatening and overwhelming contents which emerge from the dark inner depths of the unconscious. So the animus and anima is to remain in place individual unconscious and the collective unconscious. Jung believed that animus and anima should function as a bridge or a door leading to the images of the collective unconscious. It is manifested in dreams or visions with a member of opposite gender offering guidance. Self The deepest layer of the psyche, the archetype of wholeness, which Jung called the self and viewed as the most important of all the archetypes. So self defines as the central archetypes of personality represents wholeness. Proper expression of the self is the goal of the individual process. The self is our life goal, for it is the completest expression of that faithful combination we call individuality. The self archetypes act as the unifying or organizing principle of the psyche. In fact, Jung saw the connection with the self is important that at various times he described it as treasure that would make one independent and a link to the infinite so self oriented toward a union of the conscious and unconscious realms Jung came upon the self Let's define individuation. Individuation. Jung taught the process of individuation was essential for the well-being of society. Jung believed that conformist societies composed mainly of people who over-identify with their persona are easy prey for the rise of oppressive governments. Therefore, it is essential for any lasting positive societal change that increasing numbers of people assisted by individuation process. So Jung quoted, A million zeros joined together do not unfortunately add up to one. So that's the end of our topic. Anyone who have questions regarding Jung's theory of personality archetypes? If none, then let's proceed to the next topic in line in this lesson. So, good day everyone. I am Nemera Campano and I will be discussing the development of personality of Eric Erickson's eight stages of psychosocial development. So before we, di we discuss, 
the topic. Let us know first who is Eric Erikson. So Eric Humberger Erikson was a Danish German American developmental psychologist and psychoanalyst known for his theory on psychological development of human beings. He may be famous for coining the phrase identity crisis. So Eric Erikson was an ego psychologist who developed one of the most popular and influential theories of development. While his theory was impacted by psychoanalysis Sigmund Freud's work, Erikson's theory centered on psychosocial development rather than psychosexual development. So, according to Erikson, or Erikson's belief that mastery leads to ego strengths. Um, he also believed that a sense of competence motivates behaviors and actions. Each stage of Erikson's theory is concerned with becoming competent in an area of life. If the stage is handled well, the persons will feel a sense of mastery, which is sometimes referred to as ego strength or ego quality. So, if the stage is managed poorly, the person will emerge with a sense of inadequacy in that aspect of development. So, in this slide, it shows the pictures of short or a summary chart of the psychosocial stages of Eric Erikson. So on the left side, as you can see, it has the approximate age. And on the right side, it shows the psychosocial crisis. So um, in approximate age of infant to 18 months, um, it encountered trust versus mistrust crisis. In 18 months, in 3 years old, it encounters autonomy versus shame and doubt. Um, 3 to 5 years old, it encounters initiative versus guilt. 5 to 13 years old, industry versus impurity. And 13 to 21 years old, identity versus rural confusion crisis. 21 to, um, 21 to 39 years old, it encounters intimacy versus isolation. And 40 to 65 years old, it encounters generativity and stagnation. And lastly, 65 and older and older um, encounters ego and ego integrity versus despair. So um, the first stage uh, or the stage one or stage one known as the trust versus mistrust, it is the first stage of the Erikson's theory of psychosocial development occurs between the birth and one year of age and is the most fundamental stage in life. Because infant is utterly dependent or developing trust is based on the dependability and quality of the child's caregivers. So during the first stage of psychosocial um, development, children develop a sense of trust when caregivers provide reliability, care, and uh, affection so a lack of reliability and care and affections will lead to mistrust so stage two is the autonomy versus shame and that so this is the second stage of erickson's theory of psychosocial development that takes place during the early childhood and it is focused on children developing a greater sense of personal control so children who successfully complete this stage feel secure and confident. And while those who do not are left with a sense of inadequacy, a sense of self-doubt also. So Erickson believe that achieving a balance uh, between autonomy and shame and doubt um, will lead or would lead to will, which is the belief that a children can act with attention. So with also with reason and limits. So the third stage is the initiative versus guilt. It is the third stage of the cycle, uh, social development that takes place during the um, the preschool years. So at this point in psychosocial development, children begin to um, assert their power and control over the world in directing play 
and other um, social interactions. So the major theme of the third stage of psych psychosocial development is that the children need to begin asserting um, control and power over the environment. So success in this stage leads to a sense of purpose. So children who try to exert too much power, experience, um, disapproval will result, result in a sense of guilt. So the fourth stage or the industry versus inferiority um, takes place during the early school years from approximately years from 5 to 11 years old. Through social interactions, um, children begin to develop a sense of pride in their accomplishments and abilities. Um, children need to cope with new social and academic demands. Um, success also leads to a sense of competence while failure results in feelings of impurity. And children um, who are encouraged um, and commended by parents and teachers develop a feeling of competence and belief in their skills. And to those who receive little or no encouragement from parents, teachers, and peers, um, will doubt their abilities to be successful. So next is the fifth stage or the identity versus confusion. So the, this is the fifth psychosocial stage of development that takes place during the often turbulent teenage years. So this stage plays an essential role in developing a sense of personal identity, which will continue to influence behavior and development for the... Um, rest of a person's life. So teens need to develop a sense of um, self and personal identity. Um, success leads to an ability to stay true to yourself, while failure leads to real confusion and a weak sense of self. So during adolescence, children explore their independence and develop a sense of self. Those who receive proper encouragement and reinforcement through personal exploration will emerge from this stage with a strong sense of self and feelings of independence and also control. Control. So those who will remain unsure of their beliefs and desire will feel um, insecure and confused about themselves and also in the future. So stage six, um, also known as the intimacy versus isolation. So young adults needs to form intimate, loving relationships with other people. So success leads to strong relationships, while failure results in loneliness and isolation. So this stage covers the period of early adulthood um, when people are exploring personal relationships. So Erickson also believes it was the vital that it was a vital that people develop close or committed relationships with other people. Those, those who are successful, successful at this step will form relationships that are enduring and secure. So when we talk about the building on early stages, always remember that each step builds on skills learned in previous steps. So Erickson believed that also that a strong sense of personal identity was important for developing intimate relationships. And to those with a poor sense of self tend to have a less committed relationships, are more likely to struggle with emotional uh, isolation and loneliness and also with depression. So um, stage seven or generativity versus stagnation. Um, it is a stage where adults need to create or nurture things that will outlast them. Uh, often by having children or creating a positive change that benefits other people. So success leads to feelings of usefulness and accomplishments, while failure results in shallow involvement in the world. So during adulthood, we continue to build our lives focusing on our career and family. Those who are successful during this phase will feel that they are contributing to the world by being active in their home, and also in community and to those who fail to attain this skill will feel uninvolved or unproductive in the world so care is the virtue that achieved when this stage is handled successfully 
So being proud of your accomplishments, watching your children grow into adults and developing a sense of unity with your life partner are important to accomplish or accomplishing this stage. So the last stage, which is a stage eight, the integrity versus despair. So this is the final psychosocial stage occurs during old age and is focused on reflecting back on life. At this point in development, people look back on the events of their lives and determine if they are happy with the, with the life that they are live or they regret the um, with the life that they live or the things they do or didn't do. So Erickson's theory differed from many others because it addressed development throughout the entire lifespan, so including the old age. Other adults need to look back on life to feel a sense of fulfillment um, and also success as this stage leads to feelings of wisdom. So while feeling results in regret, bitterness, and despair. So at this stage, people reflect back on the events of their lives and take stock. And to those who look back on the life, they feel will live, will satisfied, and ready to face the end of their lives with a sense of peace. And to those who look back and feel regret, um, instead of feel, uh, and to those who look back and only feel regret, will in, instead feel fearful that their lives will end without accomplishing the things they feel they should have. So those who feel proud of their accomplishments will feel a sense of integrity. So successfully completing this phase means looking back with few regrets and, and a general of feeling of satisfaction. These individuals will attain wisdom and when confronting them. So... One of the strengths of the psychosocial theory is that it provides a broad framework from which to view development throughout the entire lifespan. It also allows to emphasize uh, the social nature of human being and the important influence that social relationships have on development. So researchers have found evidence supporting Erickson's ideas about the identity and um, have further identified different sub-stages of identity formation. Um, also, some research also suggests identities during adolescence are better and capable of forming intimate relationships during early adulthood. So other research suggests that, however, that identity formation and development continues well into adulthood. So it is important to remember that the psychosocial stages are just one of the theory of how personality develops. So some research, so some research may support certain aspects, but that's not mean that the, every aspect of the theory is supported by evidence. The theory can supported. Um, the theory can, however, be a helpful way to think about some of the different conflicts and challenges that people may face as they go through life. So. A pleasant day to everyone. This is Lynette Rojas, and at this juncture, I'm going to tackle about Sullivan's theory of self-development, his interpersonal psychodynamic theory, as well as his proposed seven stages of interpersonal development. Before we proceed, we're going to get to know first the person behind this theory. His name is Herbert. Harry Stock Sullivan. He is born in New York on February 21, 1892, and died at age 56 in Paris, France, on January 14, 1949. He is an American New Floridian psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, graduated from Chicago College of Medicine and Surgery and an author of The Interpersonal Theory of Psychiatry. There was also rumors about Sullivan's sexual orientation of homosexuality, but why is it this important? Because the personality theorist, early life history, including gender, birth order, religious beliefs, ethnic background, schooling, as well as sexual orientation, 
all relate to the pers to that person's adult beliefs. The conception of humanity and the type of personality theory that that person will develop. Moving on to the assumptions and key concepts, Sullivan's central theme of his theory is anxiety and its relationship to the formation of personality. Anxiety as a main disruptive force in interpersonal relations or the basic anxiety of fear of rejection by significant persons. So he viewed anxiety as prime motivator of behavior, builder of self-esteem, and great educator in life. Anxiety leads to non productive or disintegrated behavior, but through repeated social interactions, we develop our self system. Self system is pertaining to the patterns of behavior that define us and also protect us from anxiety. It becomes an important part of the self system. So, one of them is what we call security operations. Certain major types of security operations we have sublimation, dissociation, and selective inattention. In sublimation, for example, you are fond of brutally of making violence, but the thought of being violent is gives him or you an anxiety because it is something which is not approved by society. So the person who likes this behavior may join the army where he can express his violence in a positive cause, and this will make him decrease his anxiety. Association, which is a system of processes that minimizes or avoid anxiety by keeping parts of the individual's experiences called not me out of consciousness. While in selective inattention, for instance, you are in a library with somehow many students are there passing by or taking in that same room but you are there focusing at one pace and allowing many meaningful details associated with anxiety to go unnoticed so events focus on anxiety as being a consequence of faulty social interactions he believed people develop a personification of self and others through the integration of good me bad me and not me perception so we have here the good me it represents what people like about themselves and is willing to share with others. Well, the bad me, what people don't like about themselves and not willing to share, to share, develops in response to negative feedback with feelings of discomfort, displeasure, and distress. The bad me creates anxiety. While in the not me, the aspects of self that are so anxiety-provoking that the person does not consider them a part of the person it contains feelings of horror dread and this part of the self is primarily unconscious so similar to Freud, eric erickson and some of these other psychologists sullivan also saw into personal development over seven stages that is from infancy to mature adulthood we begin with infancy this stage has not been given so much importance by Sullivan as later stages, but in this stage, here it comes the oral gratification. Anxiety first, of course. We have here the mother as a significant person. While in childhood, syntax, syntactic language and do have imaginary payments as part of the interpersonal process. In juvenile, juvenile juvenile era we learn competition compromise and cooperation living with peers pre-adolescent in our age of 8 to 13 years old we obtain feelings of intimacy and collaboration with one peer having a same sex peer or best friend is very important in this stage in short we learn affection and respect while in early adolescent, in several charms, we go the intimacy and lust. In addition, we learn balance and security operations. Late adolescence is where we tend to balance between parental control and identity and independent identity.
And lastly, the stage of adulthood, also known as post-adolescence, where family, financial security, career, and socializing are other important factors which contribute to development. And that could be all. Thank you and God. That's it. Thank you for listening. So if you have any questions about my report and also to my other group report or their other reporters, you can ask um, if you have any um, questions. So that's it. Have a good day. Thank you.